Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Jillian, for the uh, the pre the pre the warm up. I think it's pretty fitting, and Miguel for putting us together, for kind of curating this duet here. I think it's perfect. But I'm going to be talking about um, kind of foreign objects in relation to nature in a very similar way that you're discussing. So I think it'll be a nice segue. My name is Dario Ray. I'm a master's student in art history here at Concordia University. Uh, my research it looks at the intersection between mycology, the study of mushrooms, and contemporary art. So I like to think I'm working in an offshoot of ethnomycology, which is a discipline looking at mushrooms and how they're utilized by human society. And this encompasses lots of different facets. Um, for instance, today mushrooms are replacing styrofoam as biodegradable packing material. They're used for cleaning oil spills, filtering contaminated water, mining precious metals from disposed electronics, insulating walls, erecting buildings, bioilluminating advertisements in urban space, altering perception, guiding in spiritual pursuits, treating illness, and of course eating as food. Now, they surface in the world of contemporary art in equally diverse ways. From the displacement of the organism itself, as you can see a little for Eliasson here in the Mediated Motion, 2001, uh, to artists who are working in fields of biotechnology, like Philip Ross. Roxy Payne uses mushroom morphology to look at ideas of replication. And Karsten Haller creates these large scale, often relational, installations, um, exploring altered states of mind and the overlap with psychedelic folklore. So here's just, this is some examples, but really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, so there's one quality that I hope you take away from this talk, that the, the ethno-mycological perspective deserves to be its own, its own look into art history. For today's presentation, I'll be discussing decomposition in the relation to the work of American artist, designer, researcher J. Rim Lee, as well as German artist Klaus Weber. I'll investigate the ways in which Lee and Weber utilize mycelial networks to actively respond to society's insensitivity towards the natural environment. Ultimately, it's a call for recomposition, balance, and accountability. As we will see, they both provide tangible solutions for environmental concerns. This case study is but a facet to a larger question, which is what does the mycelium network model have to offer contemporaneity? So think about this as we go along. Before we begin an analysis of the work itself, let's briefly discuss mycelial networks and their role in the ecosystem. This will help contextualize Lee and Weber's art practices and give me a chance to introduce the theoretical framework from which I'm approaching this question. Let's start with Deleuze and Guattari's philosophic notion of rhizomatic structure, twisty, nonlinear networks that allow potential for many beginnings and endings. I would like to extend the principle of heterogeneous connections from the rhizome analogy to one of mycelium. Not only is mycelium able to connect at different points and withstand rupture anywhere in the network, thus paralleling rhizomatic theory. Um, uh, but the mycelium in the natural ecosystem is capable of colonizing roots and transferring nutrients between species and or individuals within the same species. This is what differentiates the two. So rhizomes are bound to an individual organism while mycelium embodies the potential to bridge further communication, notably interspecies. So let me give you an example. If you have a tree, a flourishing tree with plenty of room, light, water, nutrient-rich soil, and it's doing quite well, and then nearby is a relative tree, think like a black sheep cousin or something, you know, that's struggling, doesn't have any water, competing for light with all the other forest organisms, the, 
the flourishing tree can transfer nutrients and energy via the mycelium to the struggling tree. And in this exchange, the mushroom becomes part of the network, or in fact is the network, and can give and take nutrients as needed to better the ecosystem as a whole. So can this symbiosis be considered a metaphor for socio-political exchange? What is the potential for humans to nurture mutually beneficial relationships with other species? As we will see, Lee and Weber's work is exemplary of these questions. You might be wondering why I'm banging on about forest ecology in our history conference, but bear with me. Before we get there, I have one more key ecological concept to share. So the particular symbiotic relationship that I just discussed between mushrooms and roots is called mycorrhizal. And it plays an extremely important role in forest ecology. But now we're going to look at even more ubiquitous function of mycelial networks. That is their role as decomposers. Without decomposer mushrooms, the entire planet would be smothered by organic matter. They are the filterers and recyclers of the ecosystem. Their strength and vigor is unprecedented, and in fact, they reign as the largest individual organism on Earth, a massive armillaria species, which some of you may know as honey mushroom. It's an edible that you may have had at a fine local Vora restaurant or maybe at a farmer's market. Uh, but it spans 3.8 kilometers, two and a half miles, in the Blue Mountains of Central Oregon. Okay, so let's turn first to the work of J. Rim Lee. Her latest project, which we'll focus on today, is called the Infinity Burial Project, a modest proposal for the post-mortem body. She's cultivating the, quote, infinity mushroom, which she plans to employ in her untraditional burial practices to remediate toxins in the human body. In 2010, she gave a TED Talk about her project, and she details all the toxins that are in the average urbanite. Uh, it's a very interesting talk, so if you want to check it out, it's easy to find online. Anyway, the idea revolves around her, quote, mushroom death suit, which you can see her modeling here. The embroidered mycelial network pattern is, in fact, spore-infused thread that acts as the substrate from which the mushroom develops. A corpse is dressed in what Lee has called ninja pajamas, and then is coated in a dry makeup, which also includes the infinity mushroom. After a layer of dry makeup, the corpse is injected with an embalming fluid that acts as a culture, a readily available food source for the emerging mycelium to eat. This infinity mushroom is being selected by Lee based on its potential to utilize human tissue to remediate industrial toxins. Those are being planted by traditional Western burial practices, as well as those sent into the air to cremation, which eventually settled the land. For her selection process, to to discover this infinity mushroom, it involves her feeding the organism her own skin, nails, blood, tears, urine, feces, to develop the most vigorous strain. She wants this mushroom to essentially recognize her body when she dies to more efficiently decompose it. Uh, this hungry mushroom germinates in the suit, eats its way through, and begins decomposing the corpse. In doing so, it breaks down and filters toxins. So this process, known as mycoremediation, is being taken up around the world, specifically for cleaning oil spills and restoring contaminated soil. So I say taken up around the world, but it's a pretty underfunded practice given its potential. So it's, there's not a lot of, it goes against a lot of the capitalist oil company mandates, and so it's hard to get funding, but it's a very prominent uh, discipline. It's a fascinating practice, but it acts in a, in a remarkable way. The mushrooms digest a substance like diesel or motor oil, for example, and breaks it all the way down to basic elements of carbon and water, rendering the once toxic substance environmentally safe. So the mushroom is able to break these hydrocarbons that are found in lots of pesticides and other toxins and clean them up into just basic elements that can then be recycled in the environment easily. So Lee is applying this fundamental methodology in her work to remediate BPA, pesticides, and heavy metals that are seeped into the earth by way of the modern corpse. Her work asks us to consider our own death. She 
She extends the notion of environmental consciousness to include a post-mortem responsibility. We must then consider our own body as an environmental toxin. This is certainly a radical notion and one that makes us confront issues of denial. Klaus Weber takes a less overtly radical stance towards the idea of decomposition, but one that in fact provokes activism from the viewer. In his installation, Unfolding Cul-de-Sac, he exhibits the strength of a mushroom called Agaricus bitorcus, known as the sidewalk mushroom or pavement mushroom, for it's notorious for penetrating asphalt. You can see an image of it here, and if you're lucky enough to see it in the urban environment, you may find it one day. The work consists of a fragmented urban setting surrounded by caution tape. Weber buries a layer of inoculated substrate under an asphalt slab. The mushrooms mature and begin bursting through the pavement. Accompanying the crack-ridden slab is a small research shed equipped with tools and supplies to manage the project. In its first enactment on an abandoned lot in Berlin in early 2000s, which is the image here, Weber occupied the shed full-time and studied the habits of the mushrooms. The work has since been restaged in the Cubic Gallery in London in 2004, and Andrew Kreps Gallery in New York, also in 2004. And the latest incarnation was in Vienna, 2008, as part of a solo exhibition titled Secession. For all these subsequent versions after Berlin, he displayed only evidence of a fictitious caretaker. Viewers were invited into the shed to engage with the materials themselves. This included harvested mushroom specimens, mushroom spawn, reference books, tools, and spore prints. How many of you have made spore prints before? No one? Oh, cool. Um, essentially, you, you harvest the mushroom and you cut off its stem or stipe, and then you put the gills face down on a white piece of paper, and you cover it with a glass bowl or something that's somewhat sealed, and it activates a defense mechanism in the mushroom, kind of forces it to panic, and it releases all of its spores, and creates a marvelous design. This is one I made of an agaricus, a different species, but the same genus that Weber is working with. Will all mushrooms do that? All mushrooms will do it. Some of the ones that are less um, obviously aesthetic will kind of like do it in more messy ways. But a lot of the cap and stem that you see around, those will make really beautiful designs in all different colors, pink, yellow, white, black, brown, purple. So you can really have a lot of experimentation with this. Uh, the other cool thing about spore prints, you can, and I think Weber gets into this, but these spores, it's a way of preserving the organism. So these will last, I think, more than a year, safely, and then can be re-inoculated to make more mushrooms. So they're kind of the, they're kind of the seed equivalent of a mushroom, but function in a very different way. So the spore prints and the mushroom spawn became takeaways for the visitors of the work, as did the fruiting bodies, which are delicious edibles. In this gift exchange, it further complicates the critique of urban, urban development. So obviously there's this erupting of the cement, but then by giving it away, there's, a, there's another level. Especially the, the eater mushroom spawn, the alive and eager mushroom spawn. The implication here is that one can simply plant these organisms to battle the metropolis, a kind of bioweapon to reclaim balance in nature. In this case, the mushroom becomes not a parasite feeding on the constructions of society, but merely an organism struggling to exist. So I think this is an amazing piece of poetry and also a call for activism. Both Lee and Weber insist that decomposition, a vital earthly function left primarily to fungi, cannot continue to exist unacknowledged and unutilized. By literally decomposing through a collaboration with mushrooms, they provide, albeit in different ways, solutions for how to recompose and reintegrate the relationship between society and nature. So I return to the original question and leave you with this. What does the mycelium network model have to offer contemporaneity. Thank you.